Hello, this is Ilana Levin, and this is Graphic Policy Radio. Between the elections and the uprisings, this episode is coming to you pretty late. I want to apologize for that. But I also wanted to let you know that I'm working on a new podcast episode that'll be a roundtable conversation to address the crisis of sexist abuse and harassment in the comics industry, as well as its intersections with racism and ableism and transphobia. I'm recording this intro now because of the recent news about Warren Ellis and Cameron Stewart and other people in the comics world, largely men, who have been accused of really upsetting sexual harassment or other forms of predatory behavior. Some of the specifics are new, and some of the specifics are old. Like the case of Scott Lubdell, writer of Red Hood and The Outlaws and some other comics at DC and Dynamite. He's a sexual harasser whose misconduct has been known for years and years and is stepping down from his long-running DC comic series, but that seems to be entirely of his own volition. All of this is part of a broader problem in the comics industry. Sure, the world at large is full of this shit. But here it plays out in ways particular to nerd spaces and with particular challenges in this creative industry. Graphicpolicy.com, the site this podcast is affiliated with, ran a story by Janelle Aslin back in 2015 called Enough is Enough, Dark Horse's Scott Alley's Assaulting Behavior. 2015. And yet Allie continued to work for Dark Horse until 2017, and then continued as a freelancer uh, working on some of Dark Horse's biggest properties until last week. Allie was hired for the Las Vegas shooting fundraising anthology published by Image Comics well after the initial reporting in 2015, and after his behavior was widely known. None of this is news. A couple of years back... um, my, on the show, my friend Paula Brantner, uh, formerly the head of Workplace Fairness, a nonprofit organization that fights workplace harassment, um, joined us on the show to talk about how to address harassment in the workplace. Definitely go back and give that episode a listen. It is sadly just as relevant as today. There is, as of yet, no actual systemic change in the comics industry to address abuse, racism, sexism, transphobia, ableism, or any of the other systems of oppression in any significant way. That work still lies ahead. And there are voices that have been pushing for these changes for years. I'll have a few of them with me on the podcast very soon, and I look forward to having that conversation with them, and I hope you'll join us for that as well. But in the meantime, here's an interview I did with a creator who exemplifies the kind of comics work I want to see more of. We talked about art and COVID and the choice to share your creativity, even when authority figures, largely men of privilege, tell you that no one cares what you think. Make the art anyway and get it seen. So here's me and comics writer Nadia Shemes, we recorded several weeks back. Really excited to share this interview with her with you now. I'm joined today by Nadia Shemes. Nadia has been on the show before with me to talk about the Birds of Prey movie. And we're finally having Nadia join the show today to talk about her work um, as a comics creator and editor. Nadia is an Arab-American comic writer and native of Brooklynite. She's best known for being the creator of Corpus, a comic anthology of bodily ailments and the author slash co-creator of Squire, a YA Middle Eastern fantasy set from HarperCollins next year. You can find her and her movie takes on Twitter at Nadia, N-A-D-I-A underscore Shemes, which is S-H-A-M-M-A-S. And that's actually maybe the first place we met was on Twitter. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Hi, thank you for having me on again. Very fun. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was really happy with our Birds of Prey episode. Um and it was one that I, I have a lot of people who don't normally listen to my show because they're not comics readers per se, but mm-hmm. I have a lot of friends who are feminist activists who were like, I want to see this movie of women beating up men. And I was like, oh, that is just the beginning. Oh, and yeah. And they all watched it and loved it and then listened to our episode together. So that's very good. No, it was it was a really fun episode. Like everybody had their own kind of opinions about the movie and it was just really, really fun to talk about. And And yeah, no, I... Still, still on team. This movie rules. <laughs> yeah, totally. I um, I haven't watched it since. I tend not to. I tend not to rewatch stuff unless it's part of like a serious, like undertaking, or it's been like a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I, cause there's just so many things I want to see, but yeah. I might actually, cause my, my, my husband still hasn't seen it. So I might actually rewatch it so that he can actually see it. Oh yeah. That's kind of the, I, I, I re I actually rewatched it not too long ago, but I rewatched it because my partner hadn't seen it and they yeah. wanted to see it. So I watched it with them and they, they really enjoyed it. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. I mean, so many, there's so much conversation about what folks are watching and rewatching right now, mm -hmm. um, for obvious reasons. And, um, uh, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot of new stuff I haven't had a chance to see, but I, I've gotten sucked into a DS9 rewatch with like oh, kind of yeah. everybody I know. I think well, what set it off is um, one of my friends said, I need competence porn of leadership making good decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, so of course I turned to Star Trek. And I was like, yeah, I can see why that would work right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, in a place where a lot of people are turning to, I mean, it's blowing my mind how many people are, are watching Contagion or um, I am Zombie. One of, I am one of those people. You are, exactly. And so I wanted to sort of talk to you as someone who was, I am like going to my like competent leadership porn, which is like, I don't even really believe in competent leadership as a thing in the real world, but like, I'm going to watch my competent Star Trek mm -hmm. leaders um, have have like complicated politics on a shopping mall in space, but you're going to the hard stuff right now. Uh, and that's not a huge surprise for me, given the kinds of stuff you write about also. What, what is the appeal of reading and watching COVID adjacent uh, stories in the, in the media right now? I think I, I've always kind of been a big fan of catharsis. I'm, I'm definitely that person who, when I'm feeling sad, I just want to be like, I just want to hear the saddest song that I can find. I just want to like, just crawl into that, into that just visceral place of horribleness. Um, I wow. guess because, you know, I, I want to, I want to feel it completely. I think that I am a person who I, you know, I'm a person with an anxiety disorder. Often I am kind of making myself, I'm often analyzing myself and I'm often kind of trying to see the logic and what's happening in front of me and, and kind of managing myself and, and managing my reactions to things. So sometimes it actually feels good to just kind of be like, no, just feel this, feel the full extent of it and, and, you know, and be there. And, and, you know, and then also, you know, I, this is kind of my relationship with horror I've talked about before, but, you know, the thing with that kind of media is that it always ends, right? Like contagion mm. has an end uh, that we mm. are not at yet. Or who knows where we're going to end. But Contagion has an end. And, and every right. bad story tends to have an end. And, and that's, you know, that closure give, gives you a catharsis that maybe the, your inability to control what's happening in the real world is capable of giving you. you know? Wow. Yeah. No, I get it. I, I'm very different, but I totally get. I mean, like, I've also been watching works. like binging Kim's Convenience for the first time and just like. Like, just kind of, so I do have the kind of, like, balance of sometimes I want to really feel that, but sometimes I just want to, like, watch about, like, a good family that owns a convenience store in Toronto. I don't know that just, show. Oh, it's really fun. It's just about, like, a Korean-American family that own a convenience store in Toronto and just their, like, day-to-day -day lives. And it's very, like, it's very Bob's Burgers-ish. Uh-huh. And I cool. just love it. It's just, it's on Netflix and it's very, very fun and, and good, feel good. And very smart. Oh, neat. Well, yeah. I like stories that are about actual working people as yes. opposed to like, I don't know, completely bullshit things that they like to do stories about. So that sounds like a good thing to exist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. at, so what what what, what uh, COVID adjacent pop culture like fiction type media are, are are you are you consuming right now? Yeah. So I did I did do the. Um, the Contagion rewatch pretty early in. Um, I did a, um, I did start watching, I, I wasn't really very familiar with zombie movies, but for some reason I started watching a bunch of zombie flicks, especially with um, my friend who I believe you also know, Vita Ayala. I do know Vita, And yes. so we watched Train to Busan together, and then we watched Girl with All the Gifts, which is brilliant. Um, and then uh, I want to, I think the next one on my list is It Comes at Night. Mm. Um, and, but I think the big one for me, like the one that I was like, I need to rewatch this was Chernobyl. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I could not watch that the first time, let alone again. So, yeah. 
But so it looks like an amazing piece of media. Oh, it was. I think I genuinely think it's probably my favorite like mini series type thing that I've ever seen in my life. I think that it's. Uh, I, I think it's it's the tops for me. I really, really, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed everything about it. Um, and also, it was very interesting to watch with my partner because my partner is actually from Russia. Um, mm. And they hadn't seen it before. And it was my second time, you know, rewatching it. So we kind of went down the rabbit hole together. And also, at least with the rewatch, I got to get some, you know, introspection on on what what, what my favorite show so that was uh so that was nice but yeah so I guess for the kind of COVID adjacent stuff as I started watching zombie flicks which wasn't really a thing that I was very interested in and then um I would recommend Girl with All the Gifts for people who are looking for some good zombie movies it's like yeah it's it's a UK one it's very it's probably one of the better ones that I've seen in that genre but yeah no so yeah I, I think I just I want to, I, I, and also, you know, I'm sure a lot of writers and readers are like this, but, um, you, you can, can sometimes when things are happening to you as a young person or, or you can contextualize it by, you know, it, it being a story. Like, it's almost like, I, I find sometimes when I'm having a really hard time, I will write back the events that are troubling me back to myself as if I am telling them to another person or another reader. And it kind of putting it in a narrative makes it clearer to me and and a little bit more easy to manage. So I think that's something that I've always done, even when I was a kid, um, is just kind of write out the hard parts. And so I, uh, I think so I tend to do the same thing when things are really rough. I just reconsume that because if it's in a narrative, I can... I can make I can make that work. I can make sense of it. Well, that definitely gives a lot of insight into um, how and why you uh, launched uh, Corpus, uh, which is a big anthology that you, you developed and I, I'd been hearing about for a long time. Um, t- tell us uh, about what that is and how it came to be. So Corpus is a comic anthology of bodily ailments in the sense that it's an anthology about physical illness, mental illness, healthcare experiences, and then all of the weird little spaces between. Um, It's also, I wanted to kind of give a platform to disabled creators to also tell stories that may not necessarily be about their disability, but at, Mm -hmm. at still center people who are like them. Um. And I, I think that I, I went in, it was my first project ever in comics, which looking back on it is absolutely wild because it's 300, <laughs> it's like two, 300 pages long. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, um, it is quite it, a corpus. It, it is quite a corpus. Yeah. And, and I mean, the title was so perfect for it because, um, I did want it to kind of be like a mishmash of just a lot of different pieces that all have to do with issues of the body and healthcare. Um, I didn't really, it was, I didn't really want to put a limitation on what healthcare story. Um, but yeah, so ultimately I'm type one diabetic. And, um, around the time that I came up with Corpus was, uh, the very end of 2017. Um, I had just, Mm. I had, uh, graduated college. Um, I had, uh, like at the end of 2016, I had just lost my first job out of college, um, and I was trying to break into comics with no avail and totally devastated. Um, I had done Marvel editorial internships, but other than that, I just could not find my way in. So I had decided, like, you know what? I want to make a project. I want to make something personal to me. And then around that same time, um, I we were kind of the healthcare conversation was happening for the first time in the Trump administration where they were talking about, you know, cutting back Obamacare or, you know, the Affordable Care Act. And uh, I remember this thing that Paul Ryan said, where he said, um, why should the healthy have to pay for the sick? And that statement was (laughs) so, you know, mind boggling to me because one, I was like, do you know who's sick? Everyone, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, I think that when you talk about disabled people, that framing makes it kind of like a dehumanized horde of people who are sitting at home waiting for your money when often disabled people 
are, you know, forced to work <laughs> through their, di- through, you know, through their disability. And it's, and it, and it's, uh, and, you know, so it's, it just kind of, it blew my mind. And then the other thing was just the assuredness of, I will always be healthy in that statement. Um, right. And I realized that, you know, if there's one thing I can promise anyone, it's that you will get sick and you will die. And we live in a situation, in a country where, especially now, I think we're seeing kind of the effects of this, where um, if your employment and healthcare are tied together, you know, it can't just withstand anything. It just takes one economic problem to completely ruin your life, one health problem out of nowhere to completely ruin your life. And the thing about people that I'm realizing is that you don't really think it's going to be you until it's you. And I think that maybe disabled folks uh, or even just marginalized folks in general probably have a better sense of the way that kind of danger is, you know, the idea of safety is, is simply that it's an idea. So, yeah. Uh, so anyway, all of this was kind of, I was getting really annoyed with the kind of national conversation. I was annoyed with my personal life and this came together and I was like, I'm going to do corpus. And, you know, if there's, because I want to tell my story and I'm sure there are other, and you know, there are no diabetics in fiction. I'm tired of this. You know, I'm sure there are other people who are also tired. Let's see if I can find them. And then I found them. I found a bunch of them. Um, a big part of this was, you know, I did an online launch. I made like a WordPress and stuff and I opened submissions, but also I went to New York Comic Con and I printed out flyers and I handed out those flyers to literally anyone in Artist Alley or anyone wow. ever. I mean, I handed like, I literally handed these flyers. Like I remember I handed a flyer to like Tom King, the poor man, and just was like, here, <laughs> <laughs> submit to my anthology. I'm no one. <laughs> you know That's what I awesome. mean? Like, so, um, but, you know, but yeah, I, I handed that flyer out to like anybody of any kind of vibe. I was like, you like give this a shot. And I may, I met, I think like 80% of the people who I'm friends with right now in this industry through just doing that um, chaotic energy style. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. I, yeah, and, no, it's just, it's just, it's just like very like brave and like taking things into your own hands and, and showing vision, you know? Yeah, I I hope so. I mean, I I think I just was like trying very hard to just make it happen. You know, I I just I knew I I I kind of was all in on it. I was like this is my my last shot at comics. Like this is not working out for me and it doesn't work out for a lot of people and if I can and then also I I started getting, you know, as the project grew, I got buoyed by the enthusiasm that the people who were part of the project had for it. And I realized that like, oh, this is a, you know, I always knew it was bigger than me, but it was very much like, oh, this is bigger than me. I have to do a good job. Um, yeah. Yeah. Was it a combination where there established creators who were, who came out to be supportive too? There were, there were a lot of uh, established creators who came out to, to be supportive and, and were very supportive online. Um, and that was all v- always very, very touching. Um, I I remember um, I got just a lot of signal boosting. I remember, um, you know, like Erica Henderson, Chip Sarsky, like uh, all these people were very, you know, and then and then of course there were a lot of established people who actually came on and, and worked on the project, like Chris Sabella and Tini Howard, Ryan Katie and Vita themselves. And it was just, you know, it was really... Um, and Ram V and just, just like a million mm. people whose, whose work I really, and, and Maddie G, sorry, just a lot of people whose work I really respected who I, you know, did not think would say yes, ended up saying yes and signal mm-hmm. boosted and supported the project. And it, uh, that meant a lot to me as uh, somebody who, you know, didn't always have the easiest time, like finding a community growing up. Um, and so this was kind of the moment where I was very, very overwhelmed with the amount of support and love that the, the industry generally gave to Corpus. Um, were there, were there any stories in it, um, that particularly surprised you in terms of the approach that they took to talk about something? I think that, um, one of my, one of my favorites in, in the, in the book, well, one, um, I remember that actually Maddie G., had originally um that wasn't the story that they pitched um and then they kind of decided to change it and I was uh totally on board 
for that. Um, he originally pitched a story about a time that he licked a subway pole and got thrush mouth. Ooh. And which, like, with his style would have been sick. Like, it would have been a wild comic. And uh, with his, like, really, like, bright, you know, in-your-face style. Um, But then then he was like, actually, I'd really like to talk about mental health and and gender. And I was like, yeah, of course. And that ended up being, I think, one of my pops in the whole in the whole book another one that really was fun to work on really impressed me was um Matthew Ehrman's one about like mental health and 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 he categorized it as a uh, monster that you know like with these like messed up antlers that shows up at your doorstep that you don't want to confront and there's no healing that can be done until you confront it um and about kind of coming to terms with the fact that you do need to 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 basically admit that you need help in order to be helped. And and I thought that that it was very painterly and moody and really beautiful. So I remember that being like a particularly gorgeous one. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, I just remember those two standing out. I, I, the mental health section was very, very nice. You know? Yeah, I definitely saw a lot of really good stuff in there. I think comics are a space where there's been a lot of amazing writing done around mental health, but also sometimes like the metaphors don't land right. Like it can be really make very, very mixed bag depending mm-hmm. on how thoughtful someone is being with their handling or not. Yeah. Um, so it was nice to see uh, comics where people were, were like, had really done thinking oh, yeah, about no. it. I mean, I think that everyone who was in it kind of took like a like was took it very seriously took very seriously kind of their role in um in like i don't know and just kind of telling their own stories and and you know and and kind of i tried to be as open as possible with kind of what would work for the spirit of the book you know Mm -hmm. um so i remember now another one um kathy leamy did a story with her mother about a syndrome that I don't even I have to look up the name of it because I had never heard of it before but it it basically the way that it was drawn and written was just about kind of this syndrome in which your hands your fingers start to uh kind of curl into a fist I think it's called Deputrin Deputrin oh, yes. disease that I've was that. an amazing comic I remember and I had never heard of it before and it was uh really really fascinating yeah i it was really really i mean it's like a really wide range of kinds of stories and different kinds of art and um i I, you know definitely like different styles of art really clear i I love the direction that you went with for the cover Who, who was the cover artist again the cover artist was actually a friend of mine named mark wang um, and he, he normally does like kind of editorial-esque illustrations. And this is the funny part. I gave him no direction on the cover. Basically, I decided I wanted to do this project. Um, I knew him because we both worked at this like extremely horrible, shitty children's pottery studio. Um, mm-hmm. and I was his manager and we were both had like the both and we all bonded over having this crazy abusive boss. So like, uh, we, we all kind of got fired at the same time during one of her fits um but basically I met him through there and I was like hey man like I want to do this thing I don't really have a name for it yet but this is like the what it's about what do you think and like in no joke like an hour he whipped this up exactly as is and he was like does this work and I was like yeah and that was it and he just like he just whipped it out of nowhere and same thing with um he also did the chapter dividers um, and the hardcover illustration and literally no, no, nothing, nothing. There was no direction. Just, hey, man, this is what we're doing. And he just did it himself because he's a genius. You know, uh, the cover, That's the cover great. is everything to me. I have it actually. Um, a funny story is uh, when I was running the Kickstarter, I was working at a tattoo shop um, and uh, hmm. I didn't have any tattoos. Um, but uh, towards the end of the Kickstarter, um, the tattoo shop, also the owner kind of sucked. And I had a feeling that when I went to Emerald City, I was going to get let go. 
Um, so one of the tattoo artists there was actually moving back to Texas where he was from. And he was like, if you want me to tattoo you, it's now or never. So I actually got, before the Kickstarter even funded, like a week before or two weeks before, mm -hmm. I got a corpus tattoo of the figure on the front. Oh, wow. On my leg. And I also, um, and, then, and then it got funded. And then I put up a picture of it on, I think, Twitter or Instagram. And then Mark Wang was like, oh, dope. And I realized that I had completely forgotten to tell him that I was going to do this. So he just found out that, like, my his art's tattooed on me through, hmm. like, online. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, that's definitely the most comics kind of comics tattoo. It's, like, literally work that you helped create. Yeah, I'm here for it. It is my only tattoo as of yet, but it's not going to be my last for sure. Um, but yeah, no, yeah. I, I love I love my little corpus figure. Well, I I can't believe that uh, you worked in a tattoo shop without having tattoos, but I'm gonna my mind is blown. Um, yeah, no, I was amazing. I was a I, the way this one particular tattoo shop in Brooklyn worked was that um, I was like the counter person, but also they didn't have apprentices. So I would do the setup and breakdowns too. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, and like cleaning the machines and stuff. Well, it's definitely a job that makes you think about bodies a lot. It's like oh, the yeah. intersection between bodies it, and art as it, body art. Wow. That's kind of corny, but I'm sorry. I no, 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 no. It, you know, I didn't even think of that till just now. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's actually very true. I definitely, oh, you had the tweet where you said, what is the tattoo you're planning on getting as soon as that's yes. something that we can do again? Yes. Oh my gosh. So now you're, you've been converted and you're a comics tattoo person. Well, <laughs> how did you become a comics person? Like, how did you start getting into reading comics in the first place? So I kind of, you know, besides kind of grabbing Archie and Sabrina comics uh, from like grocery stores, whenever my mm -hmm. parents are around, mm -hmm. um, I started kind of buying my own comics. There was a comic shop that was like two blocks from my house. Um, and I saw this, I was like a miserable little 14 year old who was like super, you know, emo and stuff. And I saw these, um, Sandman bookends and they were gorgeous and I wanted them hmm. for my birthday, even though I had no touchstone for what they were. So my dad bought them for me for my birthday. And then I was like, the front counter guy was, his name was Matt, Matthew, and he was like, yeah, well, you should pick up the comics sometime. And then I started saving up my, you know, I used to do a thing in high school where I would just, you know, sometimes skip lunch and, and save that money and buy books. Yeah. Um, and usually I bought books because there was a Barnes & Noble across the street from my school. But this time I decided to save up and buy a trade of Sandman. So the first comic I read was Sandman when I was 14. And then I took a hard turn and read the Scott Pilgrim series. And then I took another hard turn and read Watchmen. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I started reading a bunch of like cartoonist stuff, just like Dan Klaus and um, Adrian Tomine and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then eventually the same guy, Matt, was like, well, if you're getting tired of just write, reading indie stuff, um, you know, there is some good superhero stuff. So then uh, around the time I was like 16-ish, he handed me um, Marvels by uh, Kurt Busiek mm -hmm. and then um, Kingdom Come after that. And then he just mm. slowly started plying me with comics. And then at some point when he realized how broke I was, he just let me sit in the back and read comics all day. Um, whatever I wanted off the shelves. Um, so I literally dedicate my comics career to Matt, who worked at Galaxy Comics in Bay Ridge. Because, yeah, comics, yeah. because he uh, full on let me just, you know, read what I needed uh, to develop a taste for comics. Um, and then from there, when I was in college, I applied for Marvel internships. That's also kind of a funny story. Basically, the story behind that is that there was a kid in my neighborhood who I hated, who I grew up with. And he was telling everyone he got a Marvel internship. And I was like, well, if that idiot can get a Marvel internship, then I can get one. And then I applied <laughs> for a Marvel internship, not expecting to hear back. I found out he lied about getting a Marvel internship. So I was like, now I'm definitely not going to hear back. And then I heard back. So, wow. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you, Spite, for leading me <laughs> to do things. Um, now I super relate. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's amazing. 
Yeah. Galaxy Comics is such a great store for so many so many people. Um, you know, a couple of the locations have closed, but mm-hmm. the, the one of them is at least well, at least one of them is still there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure at the Park Slope one is still there. Yeah, at least. Yeah. But I haven't. I, sorry, my cat just shared okay. an opinion. I haven't walked that far north mm-hmm. yet since shit's gone down. But yeah. I assume that they're still there. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, if they when they when they might be able to open again. Yeah, hopefully, you know. But yeah, no, so um, that's kind of how I got started to, with comics is uh, just kind of the kindness of a, of a comic book store manager and, and just kind of being really attracted to the uh, extremely goth energy of Sandman. That was really key for me. I um, I was reading comics prior to Sandman, but Sandman was definitely um, a big catalyst for me to get more serious about them, too. Yeah. Um, and of course, for you, I mean, that was basically historical fiction by the time you were reading it. What, what did? How did you feel about sort of like the very, very like late eighties, early nineties ness of the material? Was that like a big draw for you too? It was a big draw because I was, um, you know, I was, I was like, I loved those old Vertigo comics. They were kind of the mm-hmm. first thing I picked up as a teen. As I, you know, I read Why the Last Man, and and I was really just. You know, I, I, I just, I was just, I really loved it. And especially with, um, I was always, I've always been a mythology kid. Like I've always like been really into mythology. Yeah. So that was another thing that Sandman kind of did for me was that, you know, kind of pulling from antho- mythology and also just like the, the weirdness and like the sexy Lucifer. And I was like, hell yeah, to all of this. Um, and, and, you know, like any good um tiny baby goth you you do start you do have your phase where you start listening to like 80s and 90s music and you start like wearing the cure shirt everywhere you go so you know i i i definitely uh embody that until i kind of came into came into my own style and 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 tastes um well i literally had a panel at new york comic-con called sandman made me goth yeah. And other things I learned from reading comics. So yeah. I think that that's pretty, as a pretty important story. And I love that it works because for me, I, Sandman was still coming out when I was getting into it. It was near the end of the run, but mm-hmm. like I'm still, and it's very much grounded in like actual ladies goth, whereas I was like involved in the 90s goth scene, but there were still people who'd been around in the 80s who were still active in the 90s, if you follow me. So it's really cool to see that that still worked for somebody who's like definitely of a different generation than me. Yeah, you know? yeah. I am, uh, I am, I guess I'm 26. So uh, mm-hmm. it's still 10 years ago when I picked up, you know, a little bit over 10 years ago when I picked up Sandman, it still did it for me. And I think that it's still going to do it for any kind of generally gothy, emo, you know, like nerdy, I think that there's definitely a, a sense of uh, longitude. I also think that we're just kind of spooky content is just kind of bleeding itself all over kids stuff now. Like I, I watch mm-hmm. over the garden wall every October yes. and I'm just like, me too. This is the best. <laughs> and this is for children. You know, same thing, same vibes with like gravity falls, which is a different, definitely different energy, but like extreme eldritch like intense, right. yeah, like, oh my God, like, okay. Yeah, so I think that, you know, Sandman's not going to lose its lose its relatability. I think it's only going to grow kind of in its own way. Um, and as an aside, I really think that Gravity Falls is a major gateway into 90s culture for the youth of today because mm-hmm. then they get into Twin Peaks. Yes, yes, they get into Twin Peaks. They get into Cryptids, which like had a moment. <laughs> cryptids are having another moment now. Um, hmm. Because Yeah, so I think... I don't know. It's it's very it's it's sort of like culture kind of always, you know, everyone talks about the 30 year cycle. But I think that like kids who get into stuff that is made by stuff who's older than them are then going to get into the original stuff. And it's kind of it just continues forever. Right. Yeah. 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 I always hated people talking about people as being too young for something or like, etc. I mean, this like generation of, of, you know, TikTok kids are going to be really into the 2000s probably and you know <laughs> we're gonna see the result of that mm-hmm. you know like like you know y2k fashion probably is gonna come back so like I, you know i think that that's because they're you know like that's like the retro like there's always gonna be people who love retro you know um, yeah that's my curse yeah i um 
like I, I was, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much aware of how that informs my tastes. Mm-hmm. I mean, and as someone who's making your own art, um, you know, you're, you're definitely not falling into just that at all though. Um, yeah. I, so, I think that, um, there is definitely, I have thought about this a lot where I thought, I thought about kind of what is the comic that made me go, I'm going to write comics. And for me, mm-hmm. I think that comic is day tripper mm. because, um, I was going through a real, a crisis when I turned uh, 19 where I suddenly got real hardcore confronted with like oh no ad- adulthood and I started getting really freaked out about like how fast felt like life was moving which is hilarious but <laughs> you know well, but, yeah. well I can't go back and tell 19 year old me like oh man just wait <laughs> but but you know <laughs> but I day tripper helped me a lot and that was the first thing that made me go like this like this is is a thing like this is a a real thing and I I want to do it um and then I think something that uh I do that is important though for me to talk about is that when I was in college I entered a creative writing program that completely destroyed my confidence in my own writing oh yes let's talk about that and um it just I had a pretty awful professor uh, he was, he had a very narrow sense of what he thought valuable writing was. The stuff I did did not fall into that. Um, I originally, you know, and then I thought like, okay, I'm going to get serious. I want to be a poet. And I was in the poetry program for a while and I still love poetry. Um, and it still means a lot to me and I still write, but, um, that program was like, so everyone in that program was just so different than me. Um, they were all like, like it's, 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 a, it's a poetry program in New York, in Manhattan, right? It's going to be all like trust fund kids. Um, mm. It's just a really different culture and like also like extremely like male dominated. And, you know, I know that we have this conversation about comics, but like in poetry, it is the classism and the like sexism is so intense. It's worse. You know, it's it's a thousand times worse. So I, uh, I really just grew to hate writing and I grew to hate my own writing and I just completely, you know, and I, I left the poetry program. I transferred to Brooklyn College. I finished up in Brooklyn College, which was the right choice for me. Um, mm-hmm. e- and then um, even if I graduated, I graduated like a year late because of the transfer, but still the right choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I basically was like, you know what, I'm... My voice is not valuable, but other people's voices are valuable. Oh, and I no. want to work in publishing to help other people get their voices oh, no. and stories out. Um, and mm. uh, definitely working through Corpus made me go like, I love this. I love editing. I love helping people. But I've got stuff I want to say. And, <laughs> and then that, so working through Corpus definitely was a big shift of like, well, you know, it seems like I've got stuff. I've got a lot that I need to say. So maybe I should try again. And so uh, that was very healing, kind of the process of doing something for myself, completely self-published. I mean, it took years off my life, no doubt, self-publishing, as hard as you think it is, if you self-publish on this scale, it is harder than you imagined. So everybody out there, like, just get, you know, who wants to do an anthology, I support anyone who wants to self-publish, especially people who want to do and organize something together. But, like, be ready. It takes... It takes it out of you. Um, But nonetheless, it is totally worth it because you basically learn, like, yes, I am capable. Yes, I am valuable. Yes, I can do this. And if I can do this, then, like, what else can I do? So, you know, Corpus was the healing in a lot of ways. That's so amazing. Yeah, I really wish I could reach through space and time and beat up the poetry professor who did that. Um, (laughs) And it's not... Like, it's a super rare thing. There's a lot of people in, you know, teaching spaces who do that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. Um, It's interesting because, like, medical needs are, like, a huge part of my own story of how I ended up, like, not working in the arts professionally. Mm -hmm. Namely, I'm... Excuse me, my cat is showing a lot of opinions. Um, Namely, I'm old, and uh, we didn't have Obamacare yet, not for some long time. And so if you wanted to have health insurance ever... You needed to have it from your job and you could never have any gap in your coverage. And because yeah. I couldn't risk not having, not having health coverage because I'm not delusional, mm-hmm. uh, one of those people who thinks they'll never ever be sick nor who has any issues to start with, 
it was working in those fields was just not an option for me. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of like those, I don't know, I just sort of all came connected to my own story in a weird way that, that way as well. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's absolutely fair. I mean, I'm, you know, not to cause panic on this, on this podcast, but my insurance ends this month. I was laid off from my Jesus. day job. So, right, you know, right. that is something that has 100% been uh, laying over my head. And, and also it has kind of really made me question my relationship with the country in the sense of I am a native of Brooklynite. I put it proudly in my bios. I love where mm-hmm. I'm from. Um, and I don't know if there's a place for me, not only in Brooklyn, but in the United States. Um, you know, just in the sense of like, I don't know what care looks like here. Um, and, uh, so, so, you know, so I'm, I'm in a place where I'm definitely reevaluating kind of my relationship to my body and also my relationship to the body politic of this country and, you know, what, what it means to kind of feel a little bit like you've been left to the wayside. Right. You know, um, so yeah, I, uh. No easy answers there. We'll have to come back to that one. Well, I mean, I'm always a bit of a dead horse, which is that like your personal problems are political. I mean, yes. I'm not saying this to solve your wish, but to show everybody's personal problems are actually broader political problems. And the solution is organizing, which of course is not a solution for like needing health insurance immediately. But yeah. um, that's but that's how I process stuff, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, you you mentioned like you're someone who's like I'm going to listen to that sad music. I'm like not capable of listening to that sad music. I'm mm-hmm. only capable of expressing anger, and uh, I channel that through political work. So there you go. And you know we need that. I mean, I I I definitely channel a lot of my political anger through my writing work, as you can probably see from my body Indeed. of work and what I'm Indeed. doing. <laughs> it's all I, like really intense. I would like to talk about your comic about Palestine. Speaking of which. Yes. Um, which is gorgeous, really gorgeous. Who's the art? Who's the who's the artist working um, with you That's on that? Natasha Alterici. Um, she oh my God. is the yeah. writer and artist, and now mainly writer on Heathen from Vault, which is amazing. Yeah, Heathen is gorgeous, and yeah. um, and has been on the show before, actually, back a long time ago. Wow. Yeah. Back when our audio quality sucked, but she should totally go listen to it anyway because it was a good interview. Um. Where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. So that's great. I'm glad you guys were able to team up on that. Um, how did how did that comic come together for you? Uh, it was really a very much, an, uh, well, it's not an autobiographical story of yourself, but it's a story of your family. Yes. Um, so for those who don't know me or this is your introduction to me, I'm Palestinian American. Um, I made a short comic that was originally part of a charity anthology called The Good Fight. Um, when I decided to be part of this anthology, I... Um, looked for artists and I kind of, I, I love Natasha's work and I kind of shot in the dark was like, Hey, Natasha, you want to do this one? And I was very surprised to hear her say yes. Um, so I was, did a part of the charity anthology, but then this year there's been a lot of, I mean, every year there's a lot of, um, discourse around Palestine, but I don't remember what exactly Is set there? me off anymore, <laughs> but uh, like I got set off. And I decided yeah. to kind of print it myself, you know, take this, you know, it had been over a year since the anthology had been published. So I decided to print it myself and also mm-hmm. to pair the short comic with um, a, a bunch of interviews that I had done with a lot of Palestinian creators who I know. And they kind of range all over filmmaking and game to dev and comics and illustration and poetry um, and just kind of to basically reflect on the nature of our work as Palestinian Americans and also on the nature of legacy because the original comic was me basically questioning what is the legacy of my mother who was an activist in Palestine you know what what does my activism look like in America as a Palestinian American yeah I I loved hearing about people's stories um you know one of one of the things that I really saw doing a lot of organizing in immigrant communities in New York is you would go and you would be canvassing somebody or volunteering with somebody and you'd be like, holy crap, you're amazing at talking to people about how to vote. And they'd be like, yeah, I used to be the mayor of my small town in Puerto Rico. And you're like, yep, that adds up. Or like, oh yeah, well, my family came to this country because death squads were sent to kill our family when we were in Colombia and everybody in my family has been a political activist forever. I was like, yeah, of course. Like yeah. there's so many people in the States who have amazing political and organizing experiences in other countries that they have such wisdom in it. And like, I think we just haven't realized that we need to really 
like learn from that a lot right yeah, now. Yeah, I have a lot of I have a lot of family who was um I mean my mom was a pretty hardcore activist in Palestine. I have had um you know, she tells me stories about people who I haven't met but were um, you know, uh communist activists in Palestine and Jordan, some of whom were arrested and taken away. Um so you know, sometimes I think to myself, like, why am I so mad? Why am I so loud? And then, oh, well, I guess that's why, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, it's definitely. And I, I, I was really cool. And I, I loved seeing the art together and the story come with that. It was thought it was super powerful. And Natasha did an amazing job. And a thing that also she, you know, just to kind of show her incredible, you know, touch and sensitivity to art, she used all the colors based off of the pal- colors of the Palestinian flag, um, which mm. is such a, such a nice touch for like such kind of a, a, you know, beautiful muted palette and, and like so symbolic. So I, I think that she, uh, no, she's, she's totally amazing. And, and, you know, I'm very glad that, you know, she was able to breathe life into this uh, little zine that I, I care a lot about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, how did you like literally go about writing your first comic, like scripting it and, and putting that together? Well, I will say that I think I'm very lucky that I got to um, do an editorial internship at Marvel because that meant that I was looking at a lot of scripts. Um, and also I was kind of just like freelance editing some friends, concepts and scripts. Um, and then uh, basically at a convention somebody asked me do you write and me being me just even though I didn't write at that point just went yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) like sure um and then they were like oh do you want to you know be part of this anthology um and I said yeah um and it was um all we ever wanted and uh yeah yeah so that was was my first comic story besides the corpus one it's just uh Mm -hmm. just kind of me being like yeah um and then and then I and then I sat down and I wrote and that one I can tell in my early writing like how you know it's like really wordy I don't know how to rely on on the visuals like I'm just it's like you know it's man like I can see my I can see my my struggles through my comic stories and I think it wasn't until um the anthology short that I saw in uh what the upcoming you died anthology which is coming out next year that i was like oh good thank god <laughs> i was like oh nice like a short script they completely you know muck up but i think that it was very important that i i did as many short comics as i did because they all taught me something i mean they you know you you're only going to get better if you if you write so you you've got to write and and i'm and for me that's especially hard because i'm a person who's so terrified of being bad at things that often I will not even try them. So it, it helps mm-hmm. to kind of have like, no, you're signed on to this. You have to do it. Um, <laughs> and then eventually I looked, you know, I, I got to a place where I was like, I can look at my old stories without instantly wanting to combust into flame. And that means progress. Oh, gosh. Well, I'd like to hear about your upcoming work, your YA book that you're working on. Yeah, um, my YA book is another situation in which I, I pulled a first. Everything is, everything is me just kind of uh, diving headfirst into something that I hadn't tried before. And just, I, I think one of my strengths is definitely that I am so passionate about the things I'm passionate about that I just, I'm all in all the time. Um, no, no bars held. So in that sense, I'm all in and I'm uh, very passionate about the things I'm passionate about. And in that sense, I, you know, um, Squire was fun. So basically Squire is a YA Middle Eastern fantasy in the sense that it is a, set in a Middle Eastern uh, inspired world that is not our world. And it's about this young girl named Isa who is part of a um, subjugated class um, that was recently conquered in a not-too-far-off war uh, by a larger empire called the Beit Saji Empire. And in 
that she's a second class citizen. She cannot, you know, any or new cannot own land. They can't vote. Um, but one of the ways out of this is to join the highest order of the military, which is the Knights. Um, and uh, she basically decides to join the Knights uh, in order to kind of make a better life for herself. But as there are active tensions between the Ornu and the Beitsaji, she hides the fact that she's Ornu. So the story follows her as she uh, begins her journey into becoming a knight, um, you know, while hiding kind of the, the cultural group that she's from. And, uh, you know, um, a big a way that this kind of started actually was just that I had been, you know, just kind of talking friendly with Sara Alfaji just as another, you know, young Arab woman who did comics, and there are not many of us, so, you know, her and I were just kind of talking back and forth and she decided that she was ready to do a graphic novel, so she reached out to me and wanted to just kind of see if her and I had any, like, storytelling cut touchstones, like, what were the kinds of stories that we liked, what did we want to tell, and then we both basically found out that we both grew up on anime, we both were huge fans and hugely influenced by work like, you know, Avatar The Last Airbender and Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, um, so, uh, from there, we were like, okay, no, we we know what kind of story we want to tell if we're going to tell, uh, you know, more, you know, a, a YA story. And it was basically instantly something in that vein. And we wanted to kind of celebrate our own culture um, and and kind of deorientalize a little bit. So there, there yes. is no there is no magic system in this uh, in this world. It is like purely just kind of a like historically historical fantasy despite it not being our actual world oh interesting yeah and that's because of the ex- problem so much of the art being exoticized like as yeah a mystical... i mean you know i think that when we, we we did talk about magic system and then at some point we were like you know what actually like you know screw magic systems like you know what no more magical arabs that's we're done with this <laughs> and um right exactly that, yeah. that's a thing yeah so we were like all right forget this and then we just kind of went into just like and we're both huge history nerds so we both did like a ton of reading about the ottoman empire and about like the way that kind of empires and, and genocides work historically and just kind of like we were uh so we both were like you know there is such a rich and luscious visual history to pull from and an actual history to pull from that we really don't need to, you know, extend so much. But we also want to tell a story that, you know, is going to be decontextualized from the way that, uh, you know, the way that Westerners look at Middle Eastern history anyway. So, you know, we and, and also, you know, the story itself, you know, I often say this, and I feel like I'm going to be saying this forever, but it's a, it's the only best way to say this, is that I'm Arab-American and everything that I am exists in the hyphen. I understand my place there, and I, I understand that also Squire is in many ways a very American story. And it's it's very, you know, we wrote the kind of story that we would have wanted to pick up as, as, as kids, like the kind of story that um, would have changed our lives maybe if we had picked it up as kids. Um, So something that isn't just about like Middle Eastern wars and torment, but something that still kind of speaks to the overarching experience of what does it mean when you are a person that the greater good doesn't include you? What does it mean when you are a person who is living in an empire in which the empire is at active war with where you're from? You know, what, what does, right. you know, how, what does that feel like? And that is not a thing that is simply just for Arabs. And so that's, so we wanted to celebrate our heritage visually and culturally while at the same time decontextualizing the story from making it an Arab story to a, just a story. And we knew that if we made this about the Ottoman Empire for some reason, like that would never happen. Right. Yeah. And you'd also have certain things that would have to be either somebody would be like, well, actually, yeah, Ottoman, exactly. So, you know, and and I no, think we know that we made a choice. They're like, well, we assume you don't know anything. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that we, you know, and also like, yeah, it's just it's it's also fun, right? It's also just I love world building, 
And I think Sarah does too. So it was just fun to be like, okay, what is the geography of this region? And like, how would that affect the culture and the people there? And you know what I mean? It's, so it's just, just, you know, to both be proud of who we are, but also just to have like a good time telling a story about this like different world in which, you know, we could do whatever we wanted in. How did you guys approach character design for it? Um, I mean, we we kind of knew, like, what kinds of characters we wanted, and we would, like, make jokes and memes about, like, who these characters were. And uh, mm. so we just talked about it extensively, like, okay, this is the kind of kid this character is. So, like, Isa is very, like, you know, shonen protagonist, you know, just, like, young, scrappy, tiny, you know, um... And then we've got, like, the very soft, nerdy friend. And then we've got, like, the tank. And then we've got, like, the the Draco Malfoy type character. And, you know, so it's <laughs> like we, we kind of, um, Sara just kind of, like, took what we talked about in terms of, like, what's the character's vibe and just ran, ran with it. And, and, you know, she nailed it. That's great finding a creative partner who you really are able to drive that well with, too. It, it was very fun. Um, it was also fun because, you know, in the script, I would, like, often leave references and I knew that she would get them. I would be like... All right. Like, I remember I left a note at one point that was like, Sarah, make this anime as hell. Um, and then, like, uh, and then, like, I would put in, like, Game of Thrones fights and I would be like, this is the vibe for this fight, you know? Um, and, like, so, and I knew that she was good. Like, I didn't have to explain it. Like, she was going to be like, oh, hell yeah, <laughs> you know? So that was, that was also nice. I think it was nice that we kind of sat down, we talked about, you know, what are, what are, you know, influences or, or touch to cultural touchstones were and when we found that they were similar we were able to kind of like create a shared language of media you know well i'm really looking forward to seeing the book when it's out we'll have to have you back to talk about it at that point thank you it's coming out next year and and you know i'm very happy about that so uh we'll i'm i'm excited for people to kind of see it it is my first graphic novel it's Sarah's first graphic novel so it's uh you know it's it's really exciting, and I and I, it means a lot to me. The story. It's you know I I say often that um I got to tell I got to do my dream project first, so like God knows what I do now. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm excited for it for sure. Well, I know that a lot of indie creators are always great at making refer- suggestions for other stuff folks should be picking up. Would you have any suggested additional comics reading, especially for folks in the COVID situation we are in right now? Oh, man, that, that's, a, that's a great question and a tough question. Um, I mean, I feel like, what am I thinking? I mean, I guess like uh, I am reading... Uh, I'm picking, I just picked up and I'm going to start reading a prose book called um, The City We Became by N.K. Jemison, which is like about kind of a, an a, almost like eldritch embodiment of New York. Like New York itself has a soul um, that I've heard really good things about. So hope I think that everybody would be into it. Um, I think for comics, um, you know, one of the comics that really like blown my socks off recently was Laura Dean keeps raking up with me. Um, that's kind of a perennial. I think that's going to be a perennial uh, recommendation for me. Mm-hmm. It's like everyone should read that comic. It's beautiful. Um, it's absolutely, you know, it's absolutely uh, just stunning. It's like beautiful. It's beautiful storytelling. It's really interesting. And it's just, you know, I think next level artistry. Um, this is where I'm going to just completely blank because I've just been watching movies okay. and TV. And, and uh, also, most of the reading I've been doing has been relating to the other projects that I can't talk about yet. Um, so <laughs> I'm like, okay, I've been doing a lot of, um, I guess, like, hint, hint, I've been rereading Neuromancer and Akira. Both are great. Check them out. <laughs> you know, so I'm like, okay. Yeah, so most of the stuff that I've been reading has been in the vein of stuff that I'm I'm also doing. So like I uh, I'm, I haven't been reading anything too exciting or something that I haven't you know read before. So I, I'm just gonna go. You know what, Laura Dean, it's awesome. Um, there's a lot of great comics coming out from people who I know, and I know it's gonna be great because I know their work and like uh, Trung uh, Trung Lei Nguyen. Uh, Ooh is uh, his book, The Magic Fish, is coming out this year. 
It's incredible. Everyone should buy it. Um, so that's a, a big one that I'm going to wreck. Um, I'll wreck anyone who hasn't heard of Shortbox yet. They don't miss ever. Everything they do you know, is genius. We haven't really covered Shortbox on the podcast, actually. Um, but yeah, they, uh, she basically does a s- comic subscription box of really like gorgeous and innovative comics, largely self-published stuff, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. and then makes it available to folks in America. Yeah. Uh, from lots of international sources. Yes. Um, actually, something I read recently, um, and this is for the adults in the room. But, um, oh my gosh, hold on. I'm like literally pulling up just to make sure that I have the, uh, the author's name, but it is a short comic, um, because I think short self-published comics are definitely where I get, where I think, I mean, it's not where I think the most innovation is happening, but like, it's, it's, I I see some really exciting stuff in like short self-published comics. So definitely short box for that is great. And then also a erotic comic called Sasha from the Gym recently came out by Otavia Hekkila. I'm very sorry. Um, they're at Clay Storks on Twitter. Um, and he, he came out with this comic, which is a 64 queer adult comic. Um, and it's amazing. Amazing. So if anyone out there is looking for that kind of content, Sasha from the Gym... It's amazing. I really, really inspired. Thank you. And where can our listeners find your work online? So you can find me mostly on Twitter, where I spend too much of my time um, at Nadia, N-A-D-I-A underscore Shamus, S-H-A-M-M-A-S. Um, I mean, actually, uh, Elena has the right pronunciation. It's Shamus, but usually I let people off the hook for that. Um, hmm. <laughs> and uh, so... Yes, N-A-D-I-A underscore S-H-A-M-M-A-S underscore. That's me on Twitter. And also my website, NadiaShamus.com, um, where I have awesome. my uh, Palestine zine up for free um, and also a short comic called Summer in Brooklyn. It's a great way to get introduced to your work. And God, we could really use some summer here in Brooklyn. Yes. Well. I, I mean, it is. Ironically, Summer in Brooklyn was a comic about me just thinking about like a day where I just got to run around the city and like as a kid and like buy ICs and like go to the library and like play in a fire hydrant. So it's like an extremely like slice of life, just kind of memory, like reflecting on what my summers looked like in Brooklyn as I consider my relationship to whether or not I'm staying here. Um, and also gentrification, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but yeah, so summer in Brooklyn, that's on my site. It's fun. It's as light as I get, probably. Um, <laughs> so I hope you guys like it. Well, I'll definitely read it on my next journey out of the apartment for the only thing I do, which is walk around the cemetery. Mm-hmm. It's all good. Is that Greenwood? Um, Are you near Greenwood? Yeah, Greenwood, Greenwood yeah. is lovely. I'm, I don't think I would be a um, functioning human being in any way, shape, or form without the access to, to Greenwood Cemetery. It's it's a beautiful... Like, beautiful historical outdoor space. Um, I think last summer I went to a night at Nimblo's there and Mm -hmm. it was, gosh, yeah. Excited to go to the cemetery. Yeah. I'm very, very thankful for that. We, we might not have yards or, I mean, really we don't have yards nor space to cross the sidewalk safely, but at least I can walk to the cemetery. Yeah. So, (laughs) Oh, my God. Well, thank you again. And to our listeners, thanks for joining us. You know, Graphic Policy Radio, we're on all the podcast places and would love to get your reviews. It's helpful for sharing the show. Uh, You can always send me questions, too, at E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. That's Ilana underscore Brooklyn. Feel free to pitch me. And as we like to say, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link 
on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.